decided to join us and to draw closer to the Word of God. Amen. We will be uh, starting our new text, and I'm sitting in tonight uh, for Reverend Black. And I will our title for tonight's lesson is Samuel's Call and Ministry. Mm -hmm. The lesson text can be found in 1 Samuel chapter 3. There are some other outline verses, but most of what we're going to talk about is going to come from 1 Samuel, the third chapter. Mm -hmm. We have two outlines, Samuel's call from God mm -hmm. and Samuel's ministry to Israel. Our lesson text, for those of us who are sitting in, begins with 1 Samuel uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and goes through verse 9, and picks back up at 19. Mm -hmm. And then it goes over to chapter 7, beginning with verse 3, and starting with 12, ending with 12. Uh, time about 1093 BC and 1047 BC. So it's a time that lasts between what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, the place, Shiloh, Ramah, Mizpah, between Mizpah and Shin. The golden text reads The Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth thee. 1 Samuel 3 and 10. Uh, what do we think about the golden text? And we'll get into the rest of the scripture. I've given it to you. It's 1 Samuel chapter 3, the entirety of the chapter, and then 1 Samuel chapter 7, uh, the first 12 verses. Uh, to keep it simple. What do we uh, what do we think? So for those of you who are used to a lecture, you're not going to get a lecture tonight. I need to see what you know. So, <laughs> so what do we get from 1 Samuel 3 and 10? If you're online and you send a, a message, uh, we will get that and we will definitely acknowledge what you have shared or answer any question that you might have. Now everybody speak at once. <laughs> God had been calling Samuel while he was sleeping, and mm -hmm. he thought it was Eli. And he went to Eli three times, and Eli told him to go back and told him what to say if uh, the voice called him again. And uh, of course, he, the voice did call him again, which was God. And God came, and he stood by him, and just as he had done the other three times. And uh, when he called him, Samuel told God to speak. And he said, I'm listening. My, your servant hear it. That means he was listening to God. Okay. And God spoke to him and told him what his mission was. All right. Good job, Mother Lewis. Karen uh, Reeves. Uh, my question was, you know, is, uh, why did it take Samuel so long to, uh, after God had called him four times that he finally uh, realized that it was God of doom? It was it the case that he didn't know God's voice, or do we not know God's voice when he's talking? Is it because we don't have a relationship with him? Or what? Oh, so you want to get deep into the lesson? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. what want. that's what you want. That, that's around the middle of. of it is applicable here since the golden text calls it out. Uh, and the question for those of you who are online who might not have heard it, uh, in the text, God calls Samuel a total of four times. Uh, the first three times he, he mistakes God's voice for that of his, of his mentor, his master, his teacher, uh, Eli, the, the priest. And he goes in to see if Eli needs anything since he is... Uh, getting up in age and his sight is failing him. Um, and the question was, why did God have to call Samuel so many times? And um, is it that he didn't 
recognize God's voice, or it is that does that apply to us today? Like, did, did I cover that pretty much? The any any anyone want to help uh, Chairman Reeves out? Well, he, he wasn't aware of of a voice from God. Period. So he just assumed it must have been Eli. When mm -hmm. you're sleeping and you hear something, well, he wasn't in tune with God, but he was in tune with Eli. So he assumed uh, he's calling me. So he would go to him. But you have to know of God having that ability to speak to you before you can know that God is speaking to you. Okay, anyone else? I was, uh, Pastor, I was thinking like, it's, it's, it's like we always say that, you know, God is, is, is knocking, but you won't let him in. Mm. And look how many times that he had to call Samuel to let him know that this, that is him speaking. But like, like, like the saying is that, you know, I'm here and I'm, and, and I'm knocking, but you just don't want to let me in. Okay, uh, uh, Deacon Jackson added to what, what Mother Griffin said, which I think you can hear, she's right by the camera, and that um, God is always not, um, but, and knocking, but it's us who will not let him in. We keep a knocking bold, he can come in. And that's because um, we won't open up, get up and open up the door to let him in. We don't want to be inconvenienced because that takes too much for us to get up out of our sleep because we'll find out that Eli was asleep. Was somebody else? Mother Lewis? Um, <clears throat> I was just going to say that uh, Samuel was accustomed to uh, tending to uh, Eli if he called him. He was very obedient, and whenever Eli needed him, he was always there. So that's why he was, uh, I mean, he thought it was Eli because he was accustomed to uh, obeying him and doing whatever Eli needed him to do. Another thing. Another good observation. Another thing is that Samuel, Samuel was still a young youth, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and what Mother Lewis had indicated, you know, uh, Eli had gotten up in age. You had alluded to that earlier. So, therefore, he was uh, very attentive to uh, Eli. And so, according to the scripture, he was not acquainted with God's voice right. at this time, okay? Right. So, he was just, he was just. Getting to get introduced to God in essence, God would introduce Himself to him. It's time for, me, for you to know me. Well, I got work for you. All right, uh, Reverend Jones said that he was youth and uh, was getting used to God's word, and, and uh, God was telling him, letting him know that He had work for him to do. Chair, Chairman Jackson. Well, I think that, uh, that with, with Samuel, I think he he knew that it was God speaking to him, but at that time, he was attending to something else, and it's like with uh, us as people and as Christians also, when God speaks to us, I think the majority of the people, especially don't know that it's God speaking because you may be getting a different answer from God when he speaks to you than what you were expecting or anticipating. Okay. Chairman uh, Reeves. Pastor, uh, too, it could have been too that uh, he was called because he had a task for him to do and so he may have not been ready for the task that he had on hand for him to do. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we have to take in consideration that we're talking about a child here. Wasn't he only 10 or 12 years old? And, Some, somewhere and, around and there. That, that's a lack of a lot of experience. So he's really only working from what he has known Growing up, whoever was over him, taking care of him, over, well, it sounds like his mother took him to the temple when he was just a babe. So he was accustomed to answering 
when the charge person called him. He didn't know about God talking to him. So how are you going to think it's something that you don't even know? Okay. I think a lot of times when uh, God is calling us, we're not ready, so we don't recognize that. We, we have to be ready to receive Christ's call. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? For those of you who are just walking in and uh, who have studied your lesson, uh, we are discussing before we move on uh, why the golden text. Why, why was it that? God had to call Eli so many times. Why do we think God had to call Eli as many times as Samuel? Samuel, Samuel, Samuel sorry. Samuel as many times as, as he did. Okay. He had not. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. He had not, as uh, Jackson was saying, uh, Trusty Jackson was saying, he had not revealed himself. Uh, uh, well, Samuel had not come in to the, been revealed to, to the Lord. He, although he grew up that way, he was trained up, but he was, he had not, the Lord had not revealed anything to him. All right, uh, Sister Kelly? He didn't know the Lord's, the Lord's voice. That somebody read the lesson. Yeah. All of these, uh, all of those were, 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 were good answers and, and spot on and reasons why that would have hindered um, Samuel from from hearing hearing the word or, or God. Yeah, yeah. But he is he is representative of, of many of us today. And I'm not talking about uh, babies in Christ. I'm just talking about Christians in general. Uh, some of us are trained in the word, but have not been intimate with the Lord. Samuel had been was it was an expert. He, he was a Hebrew. One of the requirements is they, that's what they did day in and day out was study. So he was acquainted with God's word and how to apply God's word uh, so that he, because again, in context, he had to keep the law. So he knew the word. He knew what God said do, but he had not had an intimate encounter with the Lord as of yet. Some of us uh, know the Bible, Bible frontwards and backwards and can quote a verse at will. I mean, we can call it out of the air whenever we need it to apply it to whatever situation that we need it, but we have yet to feel the presence of God. And that is because we have not, as Sister Kelly said, we have not really experienced God yet on a, on a, on a deeper level. Bible says, uh, but you believe not, as Jesus says about the Pharisees some years later, uh, uh, approximately 1,100 years later, and John 10 says, but ye believe not because you are not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and know them, and, and I know them, and they follow me. In other words, we've got to do more than just read and study the word of God. The Bible says that the word killeth, but the spirit makes alive. You can read all you want to, but until you go beyond the veil, until you, you move from the place of, 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 of legalism, where we're just doing it out of habit, and move to trying to experience God, experience God we will not, we will not, we will be like Sarah. God will be speaking to us and we will not hear him. We will constantly misunderstand what God is telling us to do and continue to go to other people. The good thing about Samuel is at least he was going to Eli. He might have been a crooked priest, but at least he was a priest. Amen? When Jesus says you, you believe, uh, but you don't believe, the word that, that, that is used there, the Greek word, piss you off, means to commit or rely on. In other words, the reason many of us don't hear God's word 
is because we have not yet gotten to the point to where we rely on or are committed to God. And we'll see the reason why so many of the Israelites could not rely on or were not committed to God and his words. Any other commentary before we get in, in further to listen? So sorry. I would say Can you speak up? Eli the priest knew God. Yes, he did. Why did it take him so long to surmise that God was called Samuel? Um, the book, is, the, uh, our commentary uh, brings it out because it was not uncommon to hear sounds in the night. It was not uncommon for, for Samuel to think after attending to his needs, especially as he got older. I didn't ask about Samuel. No, no, I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I'm getting there. So as, as Samuel's attending to his need, he got accustomed to whatever sound he heard to run to Eli to see if he was in need. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons that, that God was able to use Samuel. And I don't want to get too far into the lesson, but it wasn't that. That's no knock on Eli because he's coming to say, hey, did you call me? God had not spoken to Eli and for a very particular reason that we will find out. So God in times past, when he wanted to talk to Eli, he spoke directly to Eli. Mm -hmm. And when he was talking to Eli, Eli was telling other people what God said. Right. This is the first time now he's coming, somebody's coming to tell Eli eventually what God had said. So he had no historical data to suggest to him that God was calling. Now, after the, after the third time, three established a fact in Hebrew culture, he's saying, okay, wait a minute. The next time you hear this, if you hear it, notice what the text says, if you hear it, then you say, speak, Lord, yes. thy servant heareth thee. And we'll get into that. Um, go ahead. No, just three times. Yes. I don't, I don't want us to put too much uh, weight on three. That's just the way it happened. And we know that three established a fact. We know that three is symbolic in Israel. But in our context, it has no bearing. Um, but to point out that Samuel had not yet experienced God. He had been taught about God. He had been taken the Bible study by somebody. He had been um, taken the Sunday school by. He had been taken to church. But he himself had not yet experienced God. And although he is young, he is probably more versed in the word of God than you, are, than you or I are right now. But he had not experienced God. We got a lot of people who are black belts in word, but are getting an elf in spirituality and knowing God and, and feeling God and be able to recognize the voice of God because that only comes from spending time talking to and listening to God. We don't have a problem with talking to God, but we have a problem with listening to God. And I, you're taking me so far in the lesson that I'm not ready to go. When he says, here, you know, speak, Lord, thy servants here, comes from the Hebrew word, Shema. Shema O Israel, Adonai Alan Hainu Akah. Here, the Lord your God is one. So the word here there means I am listening and obeying. We'll listen, but we don't have, we don't have the uh, we don't have that tenderness of, of heart when you obey. And let's not knock either Samuel or Eli. Because how many times has God told you and I to do something? Huh? And we got both revelations of the word. Eli, I mean Samuel and Eli, they're living the word. It's not in not in not to Ezra's that they put the word together. So that's why they say God another day. <laughs> so, so that's where that's where we are are now. Um, I want to read the introduction unless somebody else wants to read it. it. Says the introduction says faithfulness 
is one of God's defining attributes. As believers, our hope is founded on the basis that the Lord is faithful to his promises. In response to this, we thankfully and faithfully serve him with our lives. This quarter we will study some of God's faithful servants in the, script, in, in the scriptures. Samuel, who was very young when he was called by the Lord, sets an example for us of what it means to listen for God even in unlikely times. This was the, this, nobody expected God to say anything, um, and that's based on 1 Samuel chapter 3 and 1. Four readings. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So that says to us, what does that say to us? That you couldn't see him, you could only hear him. No. I mean, that's a true statement, but, but what does that text say to us? What does 1 Samuel 3 and 1 say? To us. Pastor, is saying that there was really no format? It was just like a, like an open word to come from what the Lord was saying. It was not like, a, like this is first, this is second, this is third, this is fourth. It was just scattered all around. Um, if I can try to mm -hmm. Yes. And the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before he lied. So the child was obedient. The child knew the, knew the word of God and he responded to the priest in a manner that he should have been responded, okay? But, and the word of, of the Lord was precious. So he knew the word. He understood the word. The word of the Lord was precious, okay? But it also said in those days there was no open vision. There was nothing to, uh, to give you a vision of what's to come. Okay, so from that context. We gotta dig out the windows from that context. That's the context in, in verse one, three and one. I, I can deduce that precious does not mean uh, sentimental. Right. It means rare. Yeah. It means that God, yeah. that the condition of the people's heart was so bad mm -hmm. that God rarely spoke mm -hmm. to his people. That's what that's saying. All right. Any, anything else before we before we move on in, into the uh, into the question? Yeah, I thought y'all was gonna lecture. I know, I know. That's what that's what we get. I'm not interested in. I already know what I know. I need to know what you know. Where did young Samuel live? Under whom did he serve? Yeah, it's easy. Who wants to take? Who wants to take that? Sister Kelly, start us off. What was the house of the Lord? Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, the setting of our lesson is is, is not only around uh, the the tenth century B.C. Uh, but it's and particularly at the tabernacle. And you will see the word tabernacle and temple used interchangeably, but it's talking about the tabernacle. Again, from the, the subject context tells us that it's not talking about the tent that they pitched, that it's talking more about something that was uh, more permanent. So, and not only was he in the, uh, in the, in the tabernacle the temple, but he was under the direction of God's sent man. What were the spiritual conditions like during Samuel's childhood? What were the spiritual conditions like? There was a lot of immoral people, starting with uh, Eli's son. He was a priest, but his son was worldly and, and stuff. And the, the people <clears throat> did immoral things. They, they weren't uh, disciplined in God and all of that. Okay, all right. Uh, Sir Maurice, can you tell us where you're at? 
Sister Barbara. It says that Israel at that time. What are you reading that? Spiritual. What am I reading? Yeah, tell us what you're reading that so we can follow along. Lesson exposit, exposition. Uh, Samuel's call from God. The, one, two, three, four, the, exactly four, the fourth paragraph. All right. Israel's spiritual condition was deplorable. That's what you asked. Okay, keep going a little bit for me. Okay. The aging high could not control his wicked sons who brought the priesthood into this this disrepute this mm -hmm. through dishonest and immoral acts found in 1 Samuel 2, 12 to 17, 22 to 25. All right. And then he goes on to uh, comment on some of the things uh, that, that we are going to talk about. That we are going to talk about. Yeah. So the question was, what, what what was the spiritual condition like during Samuel's uh, childhood? It was deplorable. It was as bad as it could get from a spiritual standpoint. And from a physical standpoint, they weren't doing too much better because the Philistines were constantly having them defeat after defeat after defeat. How many of us have, have, have been handed defeat after defeat after defeat by the enemy? Every time you get up, it seems like something, another trial, another uh, uh, situation knocks you back down to the point that you get tired of, of, of giving up. And if it had not been for God's faith to us and our faith and commitment to him to the best of our ability, we would have gone into a dark room, shut the door, and just stayed there. But because of God's faithfulness, it says to us, for those who are sitting in and tuning in, it does not matter what the current situation is in your life. It does not matter what the current circumstances are in your life. God is still able to speak in times like those. Although it was, his word was precious during that time, we see evidence that he still spoke. It didn't say that his, like it was between Malachi and Matthew, that it was not non-existent. When God put himself on a 400 year sabbatical and refused to say something on behalf of his people, it says to us, many of us are going through our own challenges, whether that's directly or indirect, based on what our family is going through. God still speaks, even in times like that. Don't ever think that the chaos that we find ourselves in, that God cannot reach us from there. Case in point, when Jesus sent the disciples to the other side after the mob had, had wanted to just continue to be around him because he was feeding them good stuff, you know, fed 5,000, said that they, he said, you're not with me because of the loaves, you're with me because I fed you. And so he sends the disciples to the other side but the Bible says about the fourth watch of the night, the storm began to, to rage. Now Jesus sent them over there in this case. They weren't in a deplorable state, but Jesus sent them over there and the storm rose. Even in the midst of the storm, he says to them, fear not, it is I, Emi ego, which means I am. And they understood that as I am, that I am. So much that they, they, they thought that he was a ghost. So it does not matter whether the storm is raging around you. Jesus can still reach you from that place where you are. Because many of us walk around like, like, like Smokey said. You know, we, on the outside we look good, but on the inside we're crying with tears of a clown. We put on, on a good show. And the reality of things is, is as long as we are trying to cover it up, God would never clean it up. Question number three says, what was Samuel doing when the Lord first spoke to him? He was sleeping. So we're going to figure out the format. 
what I want as, as, as a teacher of the class. I want somebody to tell me where we're reading, because we all have books, right? And then I want you to. That's what they ain't seen you in a month, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say I didn't say my name. Don't, don't nobody but us in here know what we're talking about. <laughs> all right. Go ahead, so Spark, tell us where you're reading that. I'm reading um, the last uh, paragraph on page five at the bottom. And it simply says, Samuel himself had laid down and go to sleep. That's what he did. It, that, that's what he did. Anybody else want to add to it? Sanctuary, but 
I can't even um, equate that to it because in the holies of holies only the high priest. So you had more than, you had several priests, but there was only one high priest. That's evident. Eli's sons were priests, but Eli was a high priest. And we'll, we'll get into, into that because I think that is, that is real, real interesting, um, you know, when, when we see what, what Eli's sons did. So when we, get, when we initially go into the tabernacle, we see three pieces of furniture. We see the golden lampstand, which is where he, which is where Samuel was laying down. You see the table of shoe bread, or, or what we, we say is, is the communion. And then you have the altar of incense. Upon moving to the next chamber, the priest would take the altar of incense and light it so to kind of blur his, his, his view from God's Shekinah glory. Any questions? Uh, for what quality, what qualities prepared Samuel to receive God's call? Sister Terry. Yes. faithfulness and, and he, you, you're right he made himself available but what Samuel really did was he was prepared not only by making himself available um, as this Tara said but he also proved himself as being humble as a man of humility how many of you going to get up in the middle of the night after you lay down? Not once, not twice, and we don't need it. How many times your parents going to call you in the middle of the night? And, and if they call you three times, Lord have mercy. You ain't, going, you, ain't, you ain't getting up to go and say, Samuel, I mean, Eli, you ain't getting up to say, Mama, you ain't getting up to say, Daddy, you're going to lay there like you ain't heard a word. So he, he, he was prepared for what God had was going to call him to do because God was calling him to an office of servitude and he had already been serving Eli faithfully. We want God to call us higher, but we have not managed where we are, where we are currently at. He had served God faithfully even though he was serving somebody else. And we don't have the time to go into what that relationship would have been between Eli and Samuel and what all that entailed. It was, it was a, a, a office of, of total servitude, but he realized that the person that he was serving, he does not make the 21st century mistake that we make, uh, Deacon Robinson. He, he does not make it that, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this because I want to inflict pain on the past. I want to hinder the, the pastor's progress. I want to impede the progress of the church. He realized that his service was really to God. And when you realize who you really serve, it does not matter how the other person responds. You got a job to do, a calling to fulfill. When we do that, God will reward us. It might take a while, but he will elevate you. And once he, if he elevates you, can't nobody, you know, lower you, but you. What do we know about Samuel? He was at what? Nazarite. Huh? Nazarite. He's a Nazarite. What's a Nazarite? They're set apart for God. They're set apart for God. Who said that? Did he choose this or what? No, it's 
Mama did it for him. Hannah prays. The priest Eli thinks she's drunk because she don't move beyond the veil. So her need was greater than, than, than her reputation. Her need was greater than what people were going to say. She was snotting and crying at the altar when he realized he thought she was drunk. But it says to us, when, when we need something for God, we should not let other people interfere and interrupt our prayers. It is a vow that a person is going to be set apart. Usually, that vow is made voluntarily, which means that Samuel aligned with what Hannah had for his life. Maybe he wanted to be what, what, I don't, whatever he knew boys did back in the day. And I day it might have been playing baseball, or, or, or basketball, or football. But mama, that's what you wanted for me. I, we, we, we know that he didn't yet he knew the word, but he didn't really know the word. He knew of the word. You see, when we know of the word, we, we can, as I said earlier, we can quote Bible verses. We can, we can say all these catchphrases. We, we, we can walk the walk, talk the talk, and do all of this when we, when we know of it. But, 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 but when we really know him, Janosko, to be intimate, which means we, when you and I come together with God, something comes out of it. It produces fruit. So when we know God, really know him, intimately, it will produce fruit. So if you're living a fruit, fruitless life, then maybe you need to go make love to God. And I mean that. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. What I mean by that is give him how mad you are at him. Tell him, oh, oh, just empty yourself to him. It simply means to be set apart. It was voluntary. It, it could be done by male or female. You can find it in number six and one through 21. Um, it had a time frame. It was not for life. Now we do know people, some people in the Bible were set apart for life. Um, it, it was a specific requirement. They could not drink wine or grape juice or eat grapes or even eat the hull for the that was a Nazarite, nor could they cut their hair. That's what a Nazarite was. So that's what, what, what Samson, um, that's what he had been called to do even before he could fully understand what he had been called to do. Any questions? I, I, I think with Samuel, his mother wanted a child so badly that you have to look at the things that she prayed to God about and how, as you say, he thought she was just drunk out of her head and she was pleading with God for a child and she promised to give this child to him. And as the text says, as soon as he was weaned, she took him to the tabernacle, and I take it she left him there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, she did. She and did. so his whole environment growing up sounds like as a toddler and a little boy and everything was the knowledge of what was going on in the tabernacle. So she kept her promise, where the average child is not put in that position at that age, they will have experienced some things first. You know, like when David was chosen, he had experienced things in life before he was chosen to be king, even though he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then after he was put in place, he did a whole lot of stuff. Good things. <laughs> a whole lot of good things. That's what it's genius in. Um, Five, how did God's first message to Samuel test his courage? Man, this, this was, anybody else just get, before you get it, how, so for those of you who have read, how many of you would, would follow through? How many of us would follow through? Show hands. Follow through with what? Okay, we'll get to it. 
we'll get to what he, what he was called to do. Okay, how did God's first message to Samuel test his courage and his faithfulness to God? Did anybody find it in the book? What uh, book was the question? Yes, question five, right? yes we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I found uh, page six, second, okay. second column. Okay. That last paragraph where it says, it announced, it announced the fall of Eli and his household in graphic terms. Samuel feared to reveal it to Eli. And only after Eli threatened him with divine judgment did he So what was it? What, what did God announce? Anybody take the time there to figure out what God told us? Since I know we're good students, we're just going to review it. I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. Uh, 1 Samuel 3, 11 through 15 is where this is found. What God tells Samuel to go tell his mentor, his, his father figure, um, his, you know, his master, again, his master teacher, mentor, he tells, him, he tells Samuel to go tell him this. God said, 1 Samuel 3, 11, 15. God said, Samuel, listen carefully. I'm getting ready to do something in Israel that is going to shake everyone up and get their attention. The time has come for me to bring down in Eli's family everything I warned him, him of. Every last word of it. Verse 13. I'm letting him know that the time is up. I'm bringing judgment on his family for good. He knew what was going on. Listen to that. He knew what was going on, that his sons were desecrating God's name and God's place, and he did nothing to stop them. This is my sentence on the house of Eli. The evil of Eli's family can never be wiped out by sacrifice or offering. The Bible says in verse 15 that Samuel stayed up in bed until morning. And then he rose up and went about his way. God says, I'm getting ready to bring about judgment because Eli. Pastors 
associates, deacons, you knew what was going on in my house, and you did nothing. You did nothing. There's a danger, not only to the people who are transgressing God's law, but to us who stand behind it. Well, I'm not going to use myself because I know people ain't got no problem with me telling the pastor what he did wrong. So I'm not, I'm not, the pastor's not a good example because we got, we got, again, historical data that y'all, that, that, not y'all, that God's folks will go to the pastor and tell him X, Y, and Z that he, he ain't doing what he shouldn't be doing. So I'm going to take the pastor out of the equation because he just, he just a target. You know, how, how some of us talk when we leave church and how some of us will talk tonight. But I digress. How many of you, you know, Ben, can you go to knock and tell him, man, you ain't right. You can't keep doing this. I can't allow you to keep doing this. Oh, that was too easy. Ben, can you go to Jerome and tell him, man, we boys, we think it's thieves. We done went through some good times, some bad times, and some strange times together. But what you doing, you gotta stop. This was Samuel's mentor, his father figure, his teacher, his trainer, who had taught him everything about life. And now God wants him to go and tell that person. Let me, let me bring it closer. You know, maybe, maybe the preacher won't do it for you. Maybe the deacon's analogy won't do it for you. How many of us will go to our mothers? Oh, Kelly said she would. We can talk about Kelly. <laughs> and, and say, look, what you're doing ain't right. And, and look, notice, it was not Samuel's job to do anything but say that. It was not Samuel's job to do anything but to say what thus said the Lord, what thus said the Lord. We get it twisted because we go and we go beyond and do more than what God has told us to do. We go and we want to make the person right. No, God can say, just go tell them. The only thing Eli had to do was say, okay, you're going to be excommunicated. You cannot serve in the office of a priest any longer. But the relationship, the closeness of it prevented him these were his sons. I mean, God killed them anyway, but. <laughs> now, so, sorry. Thank you, Lord. But listen, God killed his sons anyway. What if Eli would have done what he was supposed to do? His sons would not have been killed. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, our friends, our families, our loved ones suffer because of it. They go through. We think we're protecting them. We think we're saving them. We want to have a relationship from a friendship standpoint as opposed to saving them. We have to be like the prodigal son's father and allow this boy, I don't care if he's going out there to spend it, he don't cuss me out to my face, here goes your money, you go out and you handle it. How much did that have to hurt? But he loved them enough to trust God with them. But we won't do it. We will not hand our loved ones over to God. We won't hand our kids over to God. We won't hand our marriages over to God. We won't have our, hand our, our occupations over to God. We will not hand it over to God because we don't want God to do what's right. And many people who do not turn relationships over, who do not turn children over, who do not turn loved ones over, who do not turn jobs over into the hands of the God, into the hands of God, lose those things. If not in the grave, they lose the relationship altogether, etc. It's null and void. All because we did not have the courage enough, the faith enough. It's not about courage, but faith enough. I refuse to allow you to continue to do this. I might struggle to make ends meet. I might, I, I might go through a lot, but I refuse. I'm not going to be the one. I'm not going to help you destroy this family in yourself. Oh, the 
if I if I tell them that, Brother Jones, they gonna they ain't gonna speak to me. They they ain't gonna they they gonna call me. Let's let's run on the company. I'm sorry. But we got to learn, even when we are fearful, especially with those things that are important to us, to put them in the hands of God. I didn't say it was going to be easy. I didn't say it wasn't going to hurt. I didn't say you weren't going to cry. All those things might happen, but the end result, God is faithful. And he will bring you out of it. Um, how did Israel know that Samuel was a pro true fool? Yeah, let's get this one. How did Israel know that Samuel was a true prophet of God? All these prophets, prophets, I almost said somebody's name, Lord, thank you. <laughs> how, how, all these prophets and prophetess. <laughs> Apologetics and apostolics, making bishops and and things that only are designed for God to make. But I'm gonna go there. How how did uh what's the question? I'm sorry. How did Israel know that Samuel was a prophet? How did he know? Everything that he prophesied came to pass. One more time. Pardon? One more time. Say it to me one more time. What you just said. Say it again. I, I was saying everything that God told Samuel to prophesy came to pass. Can you say it one more time? <laughs> Just one more. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll already the people tuning in heard it. Now somebody, somebody out there sitting up on a prophet right now. And yeah. ain't nothing he or she yeah. said don't came to pass. But they go there every Sunday or Saturday or Friday or whenever the designated time of worship is. They sit up on a prophet. What, what? Just one more time, motherfucker. Just Everything me. that God told Samuel to prophesy came to pass. Okay, don't take her word for it. I'm, she's the mother of the church, but I don't want you to take her word for it, and I know you don't trust me. But look in your Bible at Deuteronomy 18 and 20. It says, but the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet should be put to death. It's in your Bible. Don't trust me. I'm, I might be reading from a uh, Charlotte Bible up here or something. He said that when a prophet speaks that I send everything, not most things, not many things, not some things, not 99.9 and a half percent things. Everything that he speaks will come to pass. Go take a look at Isaiah and his suffering songs. Everything. A virgin shall bear a child. Then she bear. He should be called wonderful counselor. Prince of peace. Wasn't he that? Isn't he that? There was a ham on a tree. Wasn't he gone? And it pleased God, 14. And it what y'all like these grooves for our iniquity, chastising our pieces upon him, and all that good stuff. But I like when we go on down to 14, where it says that it pleased God that all of that happened to him. That word please is where we get the word propitiation for. It satisfied God. I'm glad God was satisfied by him being beat. And an old rugged cross hung on his shoulders. Nails in it says, I'm glad that he was satisfied because if if that didn't satisfy, we died. Yeah, we died. Okay. Second. I, I, I was excited about that because I know we got we got some people who sit up on the prophets and set up on the prophets and tuning in right now. So you take you take your prophet to, to uh Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 in his body, not yours. You might not believe. Uh, what trouble gave Samuel the, uh, the opportunity to call Israel to repent? What trouble? Speak, Lord. The Philistines took the ark of the covenant. 
So, okay, so since we're, since we're, we're up against the clock, I'm going to stop. These next questions I want to be ready for. Go ahead. Fill it's, out on, it's on page seven at the first column, second paragraph. Mm -hmm. The absence of the art from Shiloh combines the Philistine occupation of their land, led them to search their hearts and yearn for the Lord. Awesome. But, so let me run some again for me. Look, the only way that, that God could get a, a word in anyone was that they had to go through something. Sometimes the reason you're going through something is so God can get your attention. And most people, in reality, especially the children of God, we won't talk to God until we're going through something or until we need something. I'm talking about, again, moving from surface worship and, and, and surface uh, communion with God to, to, to moving to really, when you're in trouble, ain't nobody a prayer warrior like a, a prayer warrior that's in trouble. They going, in, I mean, they going back, way, way, way back. God of Abraham, I, Jacob, I have a father. One born again, I'm certain that come here, bow down to Mother Earth. As an empty pitcher before a fool. We, we know how to cry out to God when we want to do something. The storm that you're in right now, I need you to realize something. Number one, God is right there with you. Number one, God is right there with you. Just like the, the children, uh, the, the disciples on the sea. God was right there with him. Not, not only is he right there with you, he's speaking to you. The problem is, we're like Samuel. We have not spent enough time to recognize his voice. That's why we keep going to Pookie and Ray Ray for answers. That's why we keep going to Shaquita and Shanene for answers. Because we, we don't recognize what God is saying. God is trying to tell you, look, go this way and the storm will be over. But since we have not spent time with him, our storm lasts a little bit longer. That's it. The God don't want weekend visitations. He wants full custody. But too often we treat God like a redhead stepchild. Okay, so eight. Hey. How are the people uh, uh, to indicate their sincere return to God? Oh yes. Didn't this just get better as it went on? How did how was the people supposed to indicate their sincere? Because we got people talking about repentance too, and that ain't necessary. How were the people to indicate their sincere return to God? From past page yes. seven, third, uh, first column, third paragraph. Mm -hmm. If they were to return with all their heart, the whole heart. Mm -hmm. They had to prove it by an outward act. They were to put away the strange gods and Ashtora from among them. Strange gods means gods of the strange. All right, in the 21st century, what that means to us, what Harvard Jacobs told us, is we, we ain't got Bella and we ain't got Ashtoreth and we ain't got God got Isis and we ain't got all of these 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 gods, Ra, Amun, Hotep. We don't have all of these gods, but 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 what we do have is we have things that we put in front of God. And whenever we put anything in front of God, we just put that person, that thing, in a dangerous place. Because God said, I would have nothing before me. So whenever you place something in front of you. And God, you just place that person on the front line. They're like they're, they're like your right, carrying their own death notice, and they don't even know it. We got careers that come before God. We got children that come before God. We got community that comes before God. God is the one that keeps those things together. 
It says, and they gathered, for, uh, the first time it says, and they gathered, they gathered that Mishra and drew water and poured it on, and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against God. Repentance means to turn away from sin and turn to God for help. That's what repent means to turn again. So what they did was they went out and they, they had a complication. They had a revival. Talk about having a revival today. We're gonna get a horse and a fly. And one of them's gonna be asleep. Number nine says, How did the Lord honor Israel's repentance at Mitchell? We almost said honor. of forgiveness, mm -hmm. the second paragraph. Even as Samuel offered the sacrifice, the Philistine army approached, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder against them, confusing and frightening them. The Israelites then seized the opportunity to pursue and inflict on them a terrible defeat. Listen, 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 listen. I just want to point out one thing there. It says, even as Samuel offered sacrifice, even in the midst of worship, your enemy is here. Even in the midst of this holy place, Satan is here. Your enemy is here. Jude tells us that they have been ordained. And it means when something is ordained, it means that they have a right to be there. And they have sat in places right by good saints, and they blend it in. Look, when you try to draw nigh to God, the enemy is going to attack you even the more. But just like the Israelites and God thunders an affirmation of your return to him, He's sort of, now time passes. What we have to learn and what Bible study is for is to teach us that this didn't happen instantly. Years passed before all of these things transpired. So what we need to know is that even when we come to offer sacrifices to God, and we've just made an open commitment, an open confession to our families, to our friends, I ain't gonna do that no more. I'm gonna stop doing this. I'm going to treat my wife right. I'm going to treat my husband right. And make no mistakes. Man, man, can I digress for a minute? We're going to go. I, I ain't held y'all. I got five more minutes in, in, in Black's time. But, uh, but, <laughs> but um, here, 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 here's the thing. The Bible says to us, a man that finds a wife finds a good thing and See, we leave out the end. We leave out that end that's so important. A lot of men are suffering because they left out the end. The Bible says that a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. We got that, but we leave out the end. See, we, we stop reading, we stop coming to the Bible study, we stop coming to Sunday school. The Bible says that a man that finds a good wife finds a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. Husbands up in here, don't think God is blessing you because you, you, you're a deacon of your status. Or you're in the pulpit. If you mistreat that woman, the storm is on the horizon. But what we need to know, sorry for digressing, even when we come, To make, all, to make an offer. We've got to become experts in warfare. It's time out. That's why we, when, we, when hell comes, hell is going to come. Jesus said, in this life, he promises. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. He didn't specify, it's just trouble. James says, I count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, but the trying of your faith may have its perfect work. We're going to go through something, but if you as I think Reverend Jones eloquently said, if you're not battle tested, 
the wind will blow you over. Okay, who, who was that? I'm sorry, I got excited. Ebenezer, Charles Dickens, <laughs> Scrooge, <laughs> the penny pitcher. Yeah. Ebenezer is, so, is associated with a, with a miser, a stench, someone that's stingy. But Ebenezer, <laughs> the first mention of Ebenezer, it, it, it just means, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So we can put something in this. I get excited about talking about the word of God. Who, who got it? it? You got a stone. You got a stone, not a rock, but a stone of hell. That represents Jesus. Daniel said that, he, that that stone was a rock of ages. The songwriter said, rock of ages, clap for me, let me hide myself in thee. When the children of Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, Paul said it was a rock that followed them. See, y'all missed that in Bible study. Paul said it was a rock that followed them in the wilderness. A, a rock is an animal. So it couldn't have been talking about that rock. But they was talking about Mary's baby. Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of the wheel. Joshua, Battleites. Gideon, sleeps. Isaiah, suffering servant. Go ahead, man. <laughs> Adam, redeemer. <laughs> Most holy almighty God, Father God, we just count it a privilege that always, Father God, when we enter into the house of the Lord, yes, Father sir. God. We thank you, Father God, for this day, Father God. We thank you for allowing us to have it on our minds this morning, Father God, the, the urgency to get here, Father God, and, and to suffer in your word, Father God. Father God, the revelation that we got, the illumination that we received this day, Father God, even makes our heart even more excited, Father God, that we know that we need the same type of uh, 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 being uh, available and, and prepared for when you call us to do something, Father God, that we'll be have the willingness and the eagerness to do thus to the Lord, Father God. Father God, we ask, Father God, that those that tune in and those that are sitting in, Father God, have gained just as much as we have just been here, Father God, yes. and hearing your word, Father God, because your word is, is, is a rock unto our feet, Father God. And we, we just thank you, Father God. Thank you for all that you do, Father God. I ask you to bless each and everyone that's here. Bless those that had a desire to be here that couldn't be here, Father God. In the name of our Lord and Savior.